West of the Kingsport Lighthouse is a quarry called Dunwich Borers. The name of this place is a pun of an H.P. Lovecraft short story called The Dunwich Horrors. We learn why Bethesda associates this location with Lovecraft as we explore it. On the edge of the quarry is a little path between some of the giant slabs of rock, maybe it's marble, that has been taken from the quarry. This pathway is lined with all sorts of traps and a bunch of nuclear waste barrels. This is Hugh Hugo's Hole, a refuge that a former raider named Hugo made for himself. Now I read that many players actually hear a gunshot go off while approaching Hugo's Hole, only to find Hugo's body lying on the bed next to a 10 millimeter pistol. For some reason in my game, I did not hear the gunshot and I did not find his body. However, I did find his holotape. Guys don't bother me anymore. That's good. I think it's, what was that? Can't they read the signs? I think it's time I go back inside the quarry. It's been too long. No, I can't. The guys would never let me in. I could kill them all. No, no, that would, that wouldn't be what it would want. It's time to lay down. Yes, of course. It's next to my bed. I will. It's loaded. We understand from his holotape that he does commit suicide. There are blood splatters on the stone next to his bed. But what's interesting about this holotape is that he sounds a little crazy. He talks about some third party saying it wouldn't like that. And then he pauses as if receiving instructions from somebody and says, yes, that's what I have to do. It almost sounds as if he's been given instructions to commit suicide. Hugo had a strong compulsion to go back into the mine, but he didn't because the raiders didn't want him to. Some force or someone was drawing him there. We don't know why he was ostracized by the other raiders, but maybe it had something to do with his frame of mind. He sounds a little unhinged, a little detached. Maybe this craziness bothered the other raiders, which is why he had to flee to Hugo's hole. Inside the quarry, we find a lot of raiders. It's a tough fight to clear them out. In the center of the quarry, we find a bunch of cages that are suspended above a bonfire. In typical raider fashion, we find skeletons and fresh corpses inside the cages, which makes me think they were just torturing settlers and commonwealth citizens, because that's what raiders do. We don't know why they're here yet, but we learn why once we explore the depths of the mine. Now, Dunwich Borers LLC is a company that makes rock tunneling drills. It seems odd to me that they would name a quarry after their own company, Dunwich Borers. Usually a quarry has its own name. It's a location, it has a place name, like Thicket Excavations. But this quarry is named after the company, why? Additionally, why is a company that makes rock tunneling equipment quarrying stone? Usually such companies sell their equipment to other companies that then go and harvest minerals, ore, and stone. Why would the company itself create this excavation site? After clearing the raiders from the exterior of the quarry, we find a door that leads to the depths of the excavation. This, like the exterior, is inhabited by raiders that you have to clear. The first terminal we come across is Station 1. We learned that before the war, this station was managed by an employee of the Dunwich Borers Company named Bob Stanson. The last message Bob received was a summons by management to Station 4. The message doesn't say why, it just says we'll explain when you get here. According to his terminal entries, Bob was a capable manager of Station 1. Station 1 has the highest output that it's had all year. He's magnanimous towards his employees. He tells everyone they're doing great work. And his site has been incident free for 93 days. A capable manager. We also find company-wide emails from management that are also found on all the other terminals inside Dunwich Borer. From these entries, we learn that many of the employees are losing eyes due to flying rocks. Management encourages them to wear eye protection. Management set up support beams inside the quarry, but they use the minimum required to save money. This leads to a lot of rumblings under the quarry that you actually experience as you explore. They also skimped on support railings. There are a lot of high places and drop-offs in the quarry, and many of the railings are rusted out. Management promises to keep them in good repair 
but it may take a while. They encourage employees to stop logging complaints about the rusting railings. They need to work through the backlog of requests first. The company had a lot of morale events for their employees. They had an annual picnic where they reminded parents to keep their children away from the edge of the quarry. And they have a regular happy hour session at Station 3, which has been nicknamed The Pit. This pit has claimed a few lives, including an employee named Jerry who apparently fell to his death. What's really frustrating about this happy hour is that the company doesn't foot the bill for any of the booze that the employees drink during the happy hour. The bill is split between all of the employees and taken out of their next paycheck, even if they didn't show up to the happy hour. Who would want to work at that company? A short ways away from Station 1 is Station 2. This station was managed by John Hatfield. Like Bob before him, he also was summoned to Station 4 by management with no explanation. But this manager also appears to be a capable employee. He increased output by 5% the last week. He's been producing good quality cuts of stone over the past couple of months, but he complains about foot traffic from Station 3. He's hoping that the foot traffic will cease once Station 3 and Station 4 receive the materials that they need. A short ways away from Station 2 is Station 3, nicknamed The Pit. We learn why as Station 3 is at the very top of a steep cliff with a path cut through the stone that winds all the way down to the bottom. This station was managed by Bradley Ramon. Like the two before him, he also was summoned to Station 4. He's one of the managers that was complaining about the rusting railings. He says that one of his employees almost fell to his death in the pit the other day. As we make our way down the path, we find a couple of raiders at the bottom of the pit. One of them is the raider boss, Bedlam. After killing both of the raiders, we find Bedlam's terminal, which tells us why raiders were there to begin with. Bedlam and his crew directly reported to Slag at the Saugus Ironworks. I guess we are to believe that Slag was using the Saugus Ironworks to produce either machinery or maybe guns because he sent Bedlam and his crew to the Dunwich Boars to mine for iron. That's right, these raiders were apparently using the machinery here to excavate iron. Bedlam arrives to find the raiders that had previously been sent here, lazing about, eating all the food, and not producing enough iron. He takes charge of the excavation, promising to whip the raiders into shape. But something halts their progress. The last two shipments of iron made it to Saugus Ironworks on time, but the last crew he sent down into the depths of Dunwich Boars had not come back. That's why we find Bedlam there himself. He went down to figure out what was going on. But most disturbingly, his final entry repeats the same sentence over and over. I'm safe in the light. I'm safe in the light. I'm safe in the light. For the first time, we start to think that maybe Hugo wasn't going crazy. Maybe there really was something down here. On the opposite wall, we find a chained door. The raiders must have been terrified of something to chain the door shut. As we enter, we see the corpses of ghouls on the floor, and very shortly, we are charged by feral ghouls. We find a malfunctioning circuit breaker on the wall. Bedlam said in his terminal that he's safe in the light. He's safe in the light. So it makes sense that we would turn this on. But counterintuitively, turning on the circuit breaker activates the lights, which then awakens the nearby feral ghouls. You actually get a tougher fight ahead of you by turning on the lights. At the end of the hallway, we find a metal door. But when you go to open it, you're dumped into a vision. Walking forward, we see three men using machinery and working on the circuit breaker. Just as abruptly as it begins, we are popped out of the vision. The lights go dark and we're attacked by feral ghouls. But wait, let's watch that again. Did you see that? The circuit breaker shuts off on its own. It was on, but something or someone flipped it off. How could this circuit breaker turn off on its own? Are we to suppose that this mine is haunted? Are we dealing with supernatural activity here? Flipping the circuit breaker back on again wakens some of the feral ghouls. I suppose we'd have to fight them anyway and it's always better to fight them in the light. Throughout the mines, we find more raider corpses. These must be the raiders that Bedlam sent down 
who never came back. Rounding the corner and flipping another circuit breaker turns on more lights and awakens more ghouls. After clearing the ghouls, we find a terminal and next to the terminal is the sneak bobblehead, which permanently makes you 10% harder to detect. This is station four, the station where the managers from the previous three were summoned. It has all of the same security messages as the other ones, but it also includes a holotape from Tim Schutz. Tim Schutz here. No suspicions were raised when the new equipment was brought in the other day. Crew at Station 4 are still under the impression that we are setting up a new station beyond this area. The standing crew you hired are convincing enough. However, do worry about the project managers at the other stations, especially Bob at Station 1. We all know he takes his job very seriously. His bullet point updates bug the hell out of me. God tells me, we'll figure out something's going on down here sooner rather than later. Please advise. Things are starting to become a little more clear. The Dunwich Borers Company was hiding something from their own project managers. This entire excavation is a ruse to hide what they're really doing in this mine. Management summoned the three previous project managers to this location to do what with them? Maybe we'll find out if we walk through the far tunnel. These are the ghouls of the three project managers, Bob Stanson, John Hatfield, and Bradley Ramon. But we also find the feral ghoul of Tim Schutz. On his corpse, we find another holotape labeled Management. Tim, good job on keeping things under wraps. We've taken your advice and have asked the other project managers to meet you at Station 4. Stall them if they arrive before we get there. They haven't been told anything. We are very close to accomplishing our goal. Please be patient. You will be rewarded in time. Tim was the project manager at Station 4. He was the only one who was in cahoots with the management of Dunwich Borers. He was the only one who knew what was going on. The other three managers were summoned to Station 4 and waited here with Tim until the Dunwich Borers management team arrived. Arrived to do what? Let's take a look at that flashback again. We see a man at a podium with a knife in his hand, carving something. A group of people are arrayed before him, kneeling in handcuffs. Strangely, this room looks like an auditorium, but an old one. There are marble benches, and the man with the knife is standing on a marble pedestal. But outside of the vision, we don't see any of that. In place of the marble pedestal is a deep pit filled with water. Above the pit is a crane. Since we find the feral ghouls of the project managers, we know that they weren't killed. So what exactly happened to them? Well, clearly, Hugo was influenced by something supernatural. He spoke to some sort of supernatural voice that was giving him directions. We know that management was meeting the project managers, including Tim, at this location, and Tim was promised a reward. But we only see one man standing atop the pedestal. The rest are all handcuffed, kneeling before him. I think that the man at the pedestal was a representative from upper management whom Tim was expecting, and the kneeling people were employees of this company, including the project managers and also including Tim. Tim must have been betrayed by his management. Maybe management brainwashed their employees to staying in this pit. Maybe the reward that Tim was promised is the same fate that everyone else met. Eternal life as a feral ghoul. Perhaps the goal of this ceremony was to turn these people into feral ghouls. Maybe by too much exposure to the irradiated water, or maybe turned into feral ghouls by the sheer will of someone else. This might explain why we find so many barrels of nuclear waste by Hugo's hole. After all, there are many places Hugo could have hidden. Why hide in an irradiated nook outside the quarry? Maybe Hugo chose that irradiated spot on purpose. It's clear those barrels had been there for some time. There were warning signs plastered everywhere. Perhaps Hugo chose that spot so that he too might become a feral ghoul, whereupon he would return to the depths of the mine to serve... Who exactly? When you jump down the pit, you have to swim deep. 
Towards the bottom, we find a chamber off to the side. Swimming to the end, we find an altar, and upon the altar are two mini nukes flanking a legendary weapon called Krem Viz Tooth. This unique melee weapon does poison damage and causes enemies to bleed. Interestingly, the legendary effect on this weapon is actually a mod. You can remove it at a weapon's workbench and apply it to any other legendary machete that you want, effectively giving you three legendary effects. Poison, Bleed, and whatever legendary effect is on the machete that you apply it to. Back out of the side chamber, if you look down, you find something silver gleaming on the floor. If you look at it just right, it looks like a face. This must be what the management at Dunwich Borers was here to collect. The whole excavation is a cover for the Dunwich Company to retrieve this artifact. There's a crane above the hole. They were clearly hoping to retrieve this from the earth, but for what purpose? Well, to understand this riddle, we need to know a little bit more about the Dunwich Borers Company. And most of what we learn about the company, we learn from Fallout 3. In Fallout 3, there's the Dunwich Building in Washington, DC. This was the headquarters for the Dunwich Borers Company. In the basement or under chambers of this office building is an altar dedicated to apparently a god named Oog Quiloth. This is the being that the Swamp Folk of Fallout 3 worshipped. It's another reference to H.P. Lovecraft. In that story, we find a swamp-dwelling family that breeds the offspring of a dark god named Yog sothoth which sounds a whole lot like Oog Quiloth. This whole story opens up a huge can of worms that can't adequately be covered in this video. To do it proper justice, we would need to do an exploratory lore video on the Dunwich Borers headquarters and the entire DLC of Point Lookout, including the swamp folk of that DLC, their possession of the dark power Kriv Bekne, and their worship of the dark god Ug Qualath. But clearly the owners and managers of the Dunwich Borers company shared the swamp folk's fascination with Ug Qualath and the occult. They had a shrine to the dark god beneath their headquarters, and they sent out this excavation to Massachusetts to uncover some sort of unholy relic buried deep within the earth. Perhaps this dark god still lives underground and he wants to be freed. That would explain why the Dunwich Borers Company is compelled to excavate at this location. It might also help explain why Hugo felt drawn to go back into the mine. This whole story brings up some troubling notions. First of all, Fallout 4 is supposed to take place on Earth. The story of Fallout 4 diverges from our own timeline in the late 40s, early 50s. I know that there are theories that the Fallout 4 universe shares the same world as the Skyrim universe, based on the fact that we find Nern Root growing inside the Pridwen, but I think that's more of an Easter egg than anything because, you know, we only have one moon. But the official canon of Fallout 4 is that it takes place on Earth. What is this occult stuff doing in Fallout 4? Who flipped the switch of the circuit breaker? Who is giving the sole survivor visions to the past as he explores Dunwich Borers? Is there really the supernatural in Fallout 4? Apparently so. We know from Nuka World that Oswald had developed real magic. He's able to resurrect the dead ghouls around him. He's able to teleport from one location to the next. And here we find a pre-war company trying to unearth ancient relics found within Earth's crust. Kremviz Tooth itself is lying on an ancient marble pedestal deep underground. The pool itself was obscured by a marble pedestal surrounded by a marble stools in some sort of ancient auditorium. The Dunwich Boers Company has unearthed the remains of an ancient civilization that practiced the occult, that worshipped dark gods. Masking behind a legitimate looking rock drills and equipment manufacturing company. With the sole purpose of uncovering these ancient artifacts and resuming worship of Oog Qualath. We walk away from this strange side story knowing that the supernatural exists in this world. That it's not all just nuclear bombs, political strife, raiders and warfare. That there is something deeper and darker, literally, beneath the world. Whose face is depicted in the silvery statue beneath Dunwich Borers? Is it that of Oog Qualath? 
And what did the Dunwich Boar's management do to their employees? Were they sacrifices? Or were they brainwashed and influenced by a supernatural being to serve him perpetually as feral ghouls under the earth? I'm afraid we may never know for sure, but it does provide for some interesting speculation. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. I read all of the comments on my videos and I use your comments as inspiration for future videos. What did you think of this strange side quest to Fallout 4? Do you think it added to this world, making it more interesting, or did you find it to be a bit lore-breaking? I don't have an opinion one way or the other, but I'd love to hear yours. If you liked this video and you want to see more videos like it, please subscribe for more Fallout 4 content. I produce a new video every single day of the week, so tune in tomorrow to find out what I publish next. And if you'd like to support me in a more personal way, consider becoming one of my patrons on Patreon. Patreon subscribers gain access to my private Discord server, as well as a bunch of other cool Oxhorn perks. But more than anything, ladies and gentlemen, I'm just so glad that you're here watching. Thank you for watching this video, and I'll see you tomorrow morning, bright and early, with a brand new video.